We come now to Zechariah chapter 3. And this is that chapter we mentioned speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ prefiguring him as the high priest of the Melchizedek order. So while chapter 4 dealt with Zerubbabel, the leader, the king, Zechariah 3 will deal with this priestly aspect. And we're introduced to this chapter in this chapter to a courtroom scene. So we're going to set the picture. It says in verse 1, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Yahweh and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So picture the scene. The angel of Yahweh, Michael perhaps, representing the Lord G or representing God in this particular case is the judge. He's about to deliver a verdict. The defendant is Joshua, the high priest. He stands there clothed in filthy garments. And he stands there representing all of the returned captives. The prosecutor is Satan or the adversary. In another place in scripture, which we'll come to, it is the devil, the diabolos the false accuser. And in the gallery are Joshua's fellows. A verdict is about to be given. And it comes in verse two. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Yahweh rebuke thee, O Satan. Even Yahweh that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. And then the judge points towards Joshua, the high priest, and says, Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? What was the issue that was being debated, we might ask? What was the reason for this verdict? Who was the adversary at this time? Well, let's come over into the New Testament, and we're going to come to the letter of Jude, where one verse talks about this particular chapter of Zechariah chapter 3. And the verse in Jude is verse 9, where Jude writes, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, if it wasn't for those last words, the Lord rebuke thee, we may not know what he was referring to. But those words, the Lord rebuke thee, are straight from Zechariah 3, verse 2. And this is the scene that's presented. Michael is the judge, the archangel, and he is contending with the devil, the diabolos, the false accuser. The dispute is over the body of Moses. Now, how are we to understand this idea, the body of Moses? If you were to take it at face value, it might add further confusion. Were they just having a dispute over where the body of Moses was, whether he was dead, whether he was alive? But that doesn't seem to be the point. We are to understand this phrase, the body of Moses, like we understand the phrase, the body of Christ. And when we think about it, when we think about how Stephen referred to the, uh, the Israelites in the wilderness in Acts chapter 7 in his speech, he referred to them as the ecclesia in the wilderness. And Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, he says when they came through the Red Sea, they were all baptized into Moses. They became the body of Moses as we are baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ and become part of the body of Christ. So the issue, the dispute, the verdict was coming down about the ecclesia in those days of the returned exiles. 
And what was the issue that we looked at yesterday in our opening class when we looked and scanned through Ezra chapter 4 and 5 in particular? They had just got back to working and building the temple again. For 15 years, we said that temple site lay dormant. The foundation had been laid and the people had gone back and were focused on their own lives and their own homes. Now, through the encouragement of Haggai and Zechariah, they were back building the temple of God again. But the adversaries were rising up. The Satan, if you will, was rising up. And they were trying to challenge them, as we mentioned earlier. What right do you have to be building this temple? And so they were writing a letter, and they had written this letter that was going off to the king of Persia. And they were awaiting a response. And it seems to be that, the, as we mentioned yesterday, these night visions come as they're awaiting that response back. But God here is already delivering the verdict. Because this wasn't something that was up to the king of Persia to determine whether they had a right or not to be building the temple in the land of Israel. This was God's decision because this was God's land. And God delivers the verdict, Yahweh rebuke thee, he says, to the adversaries of Israel. And what encouragement that would have been to the returned captives to know that this was God's verdict in the matter. It was a decisive statement. As Jude says, a railing accusation was not brought up against him. Just a simple statement, the Lord rebuke thee. They did have a right to be there. They did have a right to be building the temple because God had given them that uh, permission. So this was a message of comfort. And Satan, the adversaries, are being publicly rebuked. And the lesson for us, brothers and sisters, is that as we go through trials and difficulties in our lives, we can take encouragement and strength that God sees what it is that we're going through and we must be resolute in the face of adversity and not become discouraged, but to carry on and to be busy in the work of the truth and to live faithfully to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about this idea, Yahweh rebuke thee, because this was Although a verdict from God in this particular case, this really seemed to be the mindset that the Lord Jesus Christ had throughout his life. As he went through and he faced adversity, as he faced the adversaries, as he faced the diabolos in the wilderness, and when he went to the cross, his mindset in the face of adversity was, Yahweh rebuke thee. Now, he didn't use those words per se, but he did say to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. He did say in the, in the wilderness when he was tempted, it is written. He said in the garden of Gethsemane, thy will be done. Simple statements that are equivalent to saying to the flesh and saying to the adversaries, Yahweh rebuke thee. And even in Christ's trial, when he was standing before his adversaries, he didn't bring a railing accusation against them, but was as a lamb before the shearers is dumb. And Christ publicly humiliated the flesh upon the cross, condemning sin in his flesh, openly triumphing over sin, as Colossians 2, verse 15 puts it. And in overcoming sin and, con and, and condemning sin and living per and by perfect, being perfectly obedient to God's will, Christ overcame sin and death and was resurrected back to life. And when Christ came up out of the grave, he was, as it were, a brand plucked out of the fire the fire of death. Did Christ need saving from death? Well, Hebrews tells us that he did. Christ needed saving from death. Hebrews 5 verse 7 says, he was as one pulled out of the fire 
This idea that is found in Zechariah, where it says a brand plucked out of the fire, Jude seems to allude to it again. And when we come down in Jude, verse 23, Notice how he says, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. And then he says, verse 23, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. There seems to be an allusion here again back to Zechariah 3, because the, the angels talks about uh, J J uh, Joshua as being a brand plucked out of the fire, Zechariah 3, verse 2, and Zechariah 3, verse 3, he was clothed in filthy garments. And so perhaps an echo back to that time. And the idea here of being plucked out of fire, being plucked out of adversity. When we think about the whole nation of Israel, they had, in fact, been plucked out of adversity. And it began when they were actually taken to Babylon into captivity. They had been plucked out of the fire that was about to come upon Jerusalem. They had been saved from that adversity. And that's why the prophets had told them not to fear going to Babylon, because God was saving them from the greater destruction that was to come. But Joshua himself, in captivity, had been one plucked out of the fire, plucked out of the fire of Babylon's adversity and the pressure that Babylon was, um, was exerting for them to conform to its ways. And so when we see this idea back in Zechariah 3 of one plucked out of the fire, it's someone being saved from adversity and from trial. And certainly Joshua as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ was, as it were, a brand plucked out of the fire of adversity. And when he rose to, from the grave, he became, he was granted immortality and these filthy garments, we could say, that he wore in verse 3 were put off from him. And so he is clothed, it says in verse 3, Joshua, he's clothed with filthy garments. Now, literally, Joshua, the high priest, would have been wearing filthy garments for two reasons. First of all, we learn from Ezra, he was involved in the work of building the temple. You don't build a temple and not get dirty, right? So he would have had on his garments the very evidence that he was laboring in the work of building a temple. But he was also the high priest. And when the priests made their offerings, we mustn't picture them as simply being there in their pure white robes, making these offerings. These robes would have been splattered with blood and marred with smoke from those offerings. They were dirty, filthy garments that they were wearing, showing us, in a sense, demonstrating that the flesh, there's nothing clean about it in that sense. It's filled as filthy garments. And so spiritually, when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, how does this apply to Christ, that he had filthy garments? In the fact that he shared our nature. He had mortality, and he had temp faced temptation and lusts, which he overcame. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he was made sin for us who knew no sin. And so in the days of his flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was always laboring in service to his heavenly father and to his brethren because he was involved, just like Joshua in the past, in building a temple. A holy temple for God, a temple made up of people. And this was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in his priesthood. We come then to verse 4 of Zechariah chapter 3. And this is again the angel of Yahweh speaking. He answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, 
I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. When we think about a change of raiment and filthy garments again, we're speaking about the fact that Christ shared our nature, and yet he did no sin. He overcame. He was brought up from the grave, and he was clothed with immortality. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says he was clothed with that house from heaven. He was triumphant over sin and death. And the immortality which the Lord gave unto him was the confirmation of God's approval that Christ was indeed the high priest of the new covenant. Now, if you just come over with me to Hebrews chapter 7, we will see confirmation of this. Hebrews chapter 7. And you might also think about Aaron. Remember in the in the um, Old Testament times, in the uh, time of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram's rebellion, part of that rebellion was that Moses' leadership was being challenged, but also Aaron's priesthood was being challenged. Was Aaron truly the high priest of God's choosing? And how did they determine that? How did God prove to the people that Aaron was indeed the high priest of his choosing? It was through the resurrected rod, a rod, a dead rod that once had been living on a tree. This dead rod bought, brought back to life again. And the same then is true of the Lord Jesus Christ. His resurrection was a confirmation that he was the high priest of God's choosing. And we can see that when we look at Hebrews chapter 7, beginning at verse 15. It is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. There's the idea of resurrection, the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then verse um, 23 says, they, speaking about the priests under the old covenant, they were truly many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, in other words, he has an everlasting life, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the utmost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And verse 27 says, Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sin and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Now, just keep that in mind, that idea. He offered up once. One offering for sin. So we come back to Zechariah chapter 3. The garments have been commanded to be removed from Joshua. This is symbolic and pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ being clothed with immortality. But Zechariah then goes on to say, or then it says, um, verse 5 and I said let them set a fair mitre upon his head so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments and the angel of Yahweh stood by now do you notice what it says there at the beginning of verse 5 and I said this is Zechariah so the angel, the so picture this, Zechariah is watching this whole proceeding, this whole court scene taking place. The judge has delivered this verdict. The judge has pointed to Joshua and said, you're a brand plucked out of the fire. He gives commandments that Joshua's filthy garments should be removed from him. He makes a statement that thine iniquity has, been, has caused to, be, to pass from thee. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And all of a sudden, Zechariah, who's watching these things, interrupts 
and says, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. Brother John Carter says in his book, God and man unite in accepting the mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. God represented in Michael, the angel, the, the judge. Man represented in Zachariah's statement, unite in accepting the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And then the angel of Yahweh stands by, it says. Even the angels, the great archangel Michael, accepts Christ and renders over him the office of the head of the angelic order. Verse 8 tells us that it says, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at, or men of sign, as the margin says. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. There's reference here in verse 8 to Joshua's fellows. And I said we could picture them sitting in the gallery, watching the procession. These fellows are seen, referred to also in the book of Hebrews. If you come over to Hebrews chapter 1, we'll find a reference to fellows. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9 says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. In reference to Joshua, the high priest, he indeed had been anointed with the oil to be the priest, and he then was in a superior office to his fellows. But these verses are, of course, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was anointed by God to the office above his fellows, above his brethren. And so he was the high priest of the Melchizedek order. And he is anointed. And he was anointed with oil to be both king and priest. And he is described as my servant, the branch. And so back in Zechariah chapter, back to Zechariah chapter 3. He's given the title, the branch, in the end of verse 8. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And then in verse 9, he's referred to as the stone. That one stone that is laid before Joshua, upon which are those seven eyes, as we talked about in our previous class. He is the chief cornerstone we learn in Isaiah 28. If we just hold a hand here and go back to Isaiah 28 and verse 16, it says, therefore, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Or it could be rendered, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Christ is the cornerstone of this temple building. And so here there's allusion to the fact of the literal temple that's being built in Jerusalem at this time, of which Joshua was involved in its building pointing forward to the temple of people that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be establishing, even the ecclesia. And he was that tried stone 
that precious cornerstone, that sure foundation. And all those, as it says in verse 16 of Isaiah 28, all those that believe shall not be ashamed. Belief, faith, is the basis upon which we are brought into the bonds or in the basis upon which we will be saved. A faith, of course, which is seen in action by being baptized into the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ and following his example. This stone that is laid before Joshua contains seven eyes, speaking about the fact that many would be joined unto this one stone. The Lord Jesus Christ was the head of the body. Many by faith would be associated with him and be considered as part of his build, part of his body and part of that building of the temple. He was to be an engraved stone. Behold, says verse 9, I will engrave the gravings thereof, saith Yahweh of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And so, just as with the high priest, in the high priest's breastplate, names were engraven into those that breastplate that he bore as he represented the whole nation. Just as the title holiness to Yahweh was engraven into the plate that he wore on the forehead. So too, this stone would be engraven, engraven with the character and the mind of his father, a character of holiness unto God and perfect obedience. And because of his perfect obedience, and his life of holiness to his father, through his one offering for sin, iniquity would be removed in one day. One offering for sin, once for all. And so, brothers and sisters, we come this morning to remember our Lord and Savior, to remember what he has done for us, to remember how he lived his life. He was steadfast. He was resolute in the face of adversity. He faced sin and said, Yahweh rebuke thee. He overcame sin and death and has been highly exalted, given a name above every name. And the high, he is now the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. We remember him in bread and wine and profess in doing so that we are the members of his body, that we must follow his example, that we, God willing, will be part of that great Melchizedek order in the age to come, and that we should follow his example. And by God's grace, we looked forward to that time when we shall reign with him, when we shall reign as kings and priests. In that day. And so may that day come swiftly and shortly. And may it be said very soon that all the earth sitteth still and is at rest.